Thank you for joining this Onc Live peer exchange entitled Refining Therapy for Chronic Lymphocytic Leukemia. The availability of novel therapies for CLL has drastically improved outcomes, but has also increased the complexity of treating symptomatic patients. Moreover, there remains a substantial unmet need for many patients who relapse. In this peer exchange panel discussion, my colleagues and I will shed light on how, these, how best to use these available therapies. We'll review the latest data, including studies from ASH 2017, looking at novel agents, novel combinations, and the impact on sequencing therapies for patients with relapsed or refractory CLL. I'm Dr. William Weirda, D.B. Lane, Cancer Research Distinguished Professor of Medicine, Head of the CLL Section, and Medical Director for the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Joining me for this discussion are Dr. Stephen Coutre, Professor of Medicine for Hematology at Stanford University School of Medicine in Stanford, California. Dr. Matthew Davids, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Associate Director of the CLL Center at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Nicole Lamana, Associate Professor of Medicine, Director of CLL at Columbia University, New York. And Dr. Xu Mao, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the Robert H. Lorry Comprehensive Cancer Center of Northwestern University. Thank you for joining us. Let's begin. So there have been dramatic changes in management for patients with CLL, but I'd like to first talk about um, when patients are initially diagnosed and um, what workup we do for those patients. So rut routinely, patients are identified as having an elevated absolute lymphocyte count by their primary care provider, typically, and they're referred to, referred to a hematologist for the standard workup and evaluation. So. Um, maybe we can start with Nicole and maybe you can comment on the workup, what prognostic factors do we need for the initial evaluation of patients and how those are, are useful. Sure, absolutely. I think it's really important, first of all, is once, you know, that initial workup for the patient is mostly spending a great deal of time talking about their disease with the patient. If they don't have any cytopenias, uh, routine blood work should include peripheral blood studies, um, including cytogenetics, fish analysis, looking for prognostic markers, um, the unmutated IGBH, of course, peripheral blood flow cytometry. CAT scanning always becomes an issue, I think, depending upon um, uh, where you practice. I, I typically do not routinely mm. image my patients. A, a good physical exam, unless the patient has a focal complaint or there's something that I am concerned about. Um, if they have very bulky lymphadenopathy on the peripheral exam that I'm concerned about, how big is the bulky lymphadenopathy in the uh, abdominal region, then perhaps I will scan them just to see. But it is routine, it is not routine practice that I image patients. So typically peripheral blood studies um, are done first and spending a great deal of time talking with the patients uh, about their CLL, their biology, you know, once you get all those routine studies back. I do uh, typically in the first um, uh, visit will also include their hepatitis serologies. I'll also look at their quantitative immunoglobulin levels and some other things, you know, routine organ function, liver studies, kidney function, so on and so forth. But it's most important to, you know, ascertain their prognostic markers, I think, with their first visit. So it, it is important to get that information up yes. front. Do we absolutely need it? What's it useful <laughs> for? I mean, I, it, obviously, um, I think an argument can be made, and as we get into an era of more um, cost containment and issues regarding cost, if somebody does not need treatment, there can be an argument to be made that you're doing those studies before somebody does need treatment because it can influence the type of therapies that you will then use subsequent to that. So if you know somebody does not obtain their fish analysis or their their IGVH status at the initial visit, you, you probably can't fault them for that. Um, of course, when you want to talk to them about potentially their time to uh, initiate therapy, not having that data, um, there is some relevance of not knowing that information, but uh, but to truthfully, um, you really need it prior to starting therapy when you're talking about treatment. And maybe we can have a little discussion about the patient population that's most commonly affected with CLL and considerations with regard to that population, not only in the time that patients need to be treatment, treated, but um, prior, prior to their treatment. So maybe, Steve, you can comment on who, 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 are, who are mostly affected by CLL? What's sort of, what are the issues with that population? Sure. So I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the average patient is 71, 72 at diagnosis, and the average patient doesn't need treatment. So the average patient comes to treatment 
in their in their 70s, and that'll you know we can talk about that when we talk about uh, choosing initial treatment. But that's a it's a real important point because um, these are older patients mostly, and uh, so there's often a lot of comorbidities, and and so we have to take that into consideration. Now, from you know the prognostic factor standpoint, I often get patients not so much straight from the internist to make a diagnosis. I get them from a colleague in the community and the patient has been told I have, you have leukemia and you're not gonna get treatment. And so of course, many are like, well, what does that mean? And so you come and as Nicole said, you spend a great deal of time talking about that. So I have a discussion of the prognostic factors uh, and you know, an individual patient can decide whether they wanna pursue those. They're just blood tests, but they're expensive. And um, remember, patients like to refer to themselves as, uh, we call it watch and wait, and they say watch and worry. And so I always say, well, if we get this information, you're either gonna be <clears throat> happy because you have a favorable profile, or you're gonna worry <clears throat> even more because you have a less favorable profile. Uh, but I'm not gonna do anything about treatment based on the information I get. So I think it's really important to, to really inform the patient about expectations. Yeah. Um, great. Matt, maybe you can comment on which factors might be useful in predicting time to first treatment. Sure. So I, you know, I think first and foremost, we look at the FISH test. Uh, it gives us a very good sense. Uh, we know that about half of patients will have a deletion 13Q, uh, which is very favorable, uh, but a smaller subset of diagnosis in the range of 8 to 10 percent are going to have the deletion 17P. And we know those patients on average may tr need treatment within the first couple of years after diagnosis. Uh, and I do find that helpful in counseling patients. Uh, it also informs the frequency of observation visits. If I have a new patient with deletion 17P, I might see them every two or three months initially, um, whereas I have another patient on observation with 13 Q, that might be every six months. So I think there are some practical implications. I think the IGHV mutation status is also a helpful piece of information to know. Uh, that tends to be a stable prognostic marker, meaning that it doesn't change over time. So if you're ever going to check it, to me it makes sense to check it at diagnosis, and then you have that piece of information. But I certainly agree with the, the sentiments that uh, you know, patients need to decide how much information they want to know, so it really is an individualized discussion with each patient. Uh, there are some other factors to consider. Beta-2 microglobulin can be a helpful test to obtain as well. Uh, I, I have a similar approach to Nicole, I think, in terms of uh, imaging. Uh, the one situation I do sometimes routinely image in is patients who have deletion 17P or deletion 11Q in particular. Uh, even if they're asymptomatic, sometimes they can have bulky internal lymphadenopathy, and I might want to know that at baseline. Uh, but outside of that, routine imaging and routine bone marrow biopsies are not necessary at diagnosis. Okay, so I, I think that's an important point. So. In terms of initial workup, patients don't need a bone marrow. The prognostic factors can be done just as easily and as reliably on, on blood. That's right. So we can get all the information we need um, initially.